Oh. Okay. Everybody, did you manage to get a good uh, rest after the morning session? Yes, bro, we got rest. Okay. Uh, do you have any, any questions before we, we resume the next session? Anyone? Okay, um, before, we, before we have our next uh, session, uh, which is uh, a session by Professor Hosman, but uh, before that, I just want to say something about the, uh, the participant um, you know, presentation on Friday. So I'll pass it on to Mas Idam. Mas Idam, you there? Yes, I am. Okay. You want to sure. explain uh, the process? All right. I'm going to share a screen so everyone, everybody can see it better. So as you can see in the screen, everyone, I, um, shortly we will, we will circulate the link for you to choose the, the time on Friday, because we are aware of the time difference. So we want you to choose by yourself based on your convenience. Some of you are probably um, very late um, in the afternoon in your time zone. So you can choose um, your time here. So um, here, the, the only thing you can fill is only two, the full name and then the time. And it goes by the last name alphabetically and then once you click that and then you will be able to go back again because it has um, elimination applies policy so then as well as the time when the time is taken so you, the the time that has been taken cannot be longer available in the in the future after or for, or for the next uh, person who want to choose the time and then once you finish, and then there will be a link where you can click, and then it will click you to the next page, to this page. This page is also available um, here in the, in, the S, uh, in the ICCTP, and it's under the schedule. It's ITT, ICCTP presentation schedule. And then here, the recorded is automatically here, but bear in mind, there will be sometimes five minutes difference after, after you respond being recorded in the Google form and then automatically um, change here in the, um, in the website. So I think that's all. And later you will see it here. It's an A mean not available. It means that um, no one has been um, done the, the input. So if there is any questions regarding this, um, this you can ask me or later you can ask to the committee in the WhatsApp group. Okay, I, sh I should also say that uh, there is a possibility that uh, some of the times taken are the only times that you can make it. So this is where, uh, this is a test to see how you guys share and how you work collaboratively. So if for example, one of the, someone has to do the presentation at a particular time and that time was has been taken. So what you can do is, is you can ask someone else to, uh, you know, you can try to kind of negotiate with someone to swap times. Right. And also right. if there is someone has a difficulty to access, and I believe um, some of the participants can also help 
just like um, I've been seeing your collaboration, your bonding in within the groups or within the chat groups. And I'm sure you can do the helping, um, helping hands, helping each other in this matter. Okay, the, the question, uh, Masidam, is someone has asked to repeat the, the instructions. Uh, so, uh, um, okay, shall I have a go at this? Sure, sure, sure. So each one of you will be given this uh, link, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, eh, uh, Masidam. So you'll mm -hmm. be given this, uh, this Google form, uh, link to this Google form where you, you you know, you, you, I mean, select your name and the time for your presentation. So we are giving you the option of picking your own time. So let's say if you go through that list and you see your name and then you just all you need to do is run through all the times that are available and click on to one of the available time. So there is a possibility that uh, there are some of you who might not get the time that you are interested in, you know, let's say if there's 9.40 is the only time you can make it for your presentation, then what we will do is, yes, Ayat, the, the link will be sent shortly. So we will, uh, we will test it out and we will send it to you perhaps uh, towards the end of, the, of today's okay. session. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. So once you have uh, selected the time, and that will be the time for your presentation. And tomorrow we will send you, so we didn't want to complicate matters. So tomorrow we will send you another uh, uh, sort of a Google form, which is the form that you're going to use for assessing fellow participants um, in their presentations. And that will be for Friday, okay? And if at any point, uh, if there is, if you seek clarification, please don't hesitate to ask the secretariat, either post a message or, you know, send us a message uh, if there is, if you wish, you know, uh, us to clarify any of this process. Are there any questions? Wonderful, thank you so much. And uh, we want to try to make it as painless as, and, and you know, as easy as possible. So at any point, if you feel that you are um, you know, having problems, don't stress, okay? So this is, uh, this is to, to make, you know, to, to try to facilitate, to make things easier. But at any point, if you feel that you are having problems, don't hesitate to let us know. Okay, without uh, taking any more time, I would have the great pleasure of um, inviting, you know, a friend of mine. Um, I know you have heard this been said so many times right through this course that, that they're all friends of mine. But because we all work in the area of peace and conflict transformation, so over the years of our engagement, we have become friends. And if we, in the point here I want to make is that if we are trying to build peace or foster peace or you know, transform conflicts uh, in a number of different societies, I think it's really important for us, first of all, to um, be friends. And with uh, Alexander, uh, Alex, as he's referred to, um, I've known him for quite a number of years. I think the first time I met him was at a conference in Paris, wasn't it? That was, you You have to unmute yourself, Alex. I think it was in the app, <laughs> Italy. <laughs> yeah, okay. I think um, for some reason, I think we, I, I was at the conference in Paris as well, ah. but we, we became uh, closer friends at okay. the next conference in Naples. Yeah, and uh, I, I still remember the, the wonderful Italian <laughs> meal that you prepared for all of us. Yeah, I want to remember that. And when, yeah, when we were yeah. in Naples. And uh, Alexander's uh, strategy was to get us to walk through one of the most dangerous streets in the city <laughs> to get to his to get to his apartment. 
and as soon as we survived, then then he fed us. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it was a wonderful okay, time. Um, <laughs> okay, on that note, uh, Alexander, it's all yours. So, uh, Okay, great. Thank you, Alberto, um, for the inv warm invitation to this wonderful course. I'm really delighted to take part. And I'm sure that we will have a very good time together. I want to, today, I want to share with you my experience in the field um, of uh, anthropology of peace building and talk about um, peace culture. And um, and this course has been really, uh, I followed the recordings um, of the sessions, of the presentations, and this course has been really wonderful. So I can build also on, on love, I can build on peace education and um, peace ecology and so many things. And I, I was especially impressed in um, Alberto's uh, biographical note um, where, he's, where he said he wanted to be a rock star. Um, and, and he said he ended up as a boring professor. But I think he is actually a very exciting professor. And, and I think we share a dream. Um, we share a dream in being fully fledged applied anthropologists. That is, uh, we don't want to stay in the university as an ivory tower, but um, we think that this university uh, shares the Eucharist society, right? To um, support uh, people's struggles um, in the different, different local arena, and the, especially um, uh, for human rights, say, for cultural rights, yeah. Um, so uh, let me um, just begin straight ahead um, in asking in, in, a, in a small warming up question. Um, so all of you, I think, are um, aware or um, uh, have participated in a, in a cultural, in a ritual. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he rocked all those two weeks. So <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah. Alberto rocked the field of peace studies and, and he does this also in the, in the deep global network, yeah? A peace network. So uh, I want to ask the students, um, uh, so this, is, uh, this presentation is for you, right? And I want to ask you um, um, which kind of uh, cultural festival yeah, or religious festival uh, is of particular importance to you? And um, for me, many are uh, important, but in, um, um, in, uh, in particular, uh, I began actually during my PhD, I had a wonderful time with my young family at the time uh, in Southern Thailand in Northern Malaysia, so very close to um, Indonesia and also culturally very close. And um, I want to speak also about a particular um, festival, cultural festival that is called Manura Longklu. And it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's in April, it's summer, it's taking place in April and summer. And um, it's, a, it's a time where the um, living can meet the dead, yeah? And especially those um, uh, lost ones uh, that, um, that one holds dearly and that uh, uh, you remember, uh, um, you have very fond memories about, yeah? And, uh, and then um, through possession of ancestral spirits, um, you can actually, uh, um, yeah, <laughs> you can actually remember um, uh, the loved ones. So, and, and, and actually you can meet them and, and have a conver conversation with them, yeah? And you invite them to, uh, to precious meal, yeah? So you prepare um, everything, you prepare the, uh, uh, things to eat, to drink, yeah, uh, delicious um, uh, special uh, special uh, dishes uh, that are prepared just for the for this precious moment, yeah, and then um, 
the, uh, the, 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 the leader of the, of the family, the family uh, or the community leader uh, becomes um, um, a medium actually becomes possessed yeah, by the ancestor spirits. And the interesting thing with Manu Ralon Kru is um, that it's taking place in the intimate sphere of them. Uh, um, but uh, it's, uh, it's actually uh, Theravada, very different religions, yeah, Theravada Buddhism on the mainland Southeast Asia side, and then uh, Islam, yeah, on the um, uh, insular Southeast Asia side, yeah. And it's there in Southern Thailand, it's just the point where the two cultures meet, yeah. And, um, but uh, there is one, um, why, why people have separate religions, separate religions, and it's also separate um, ways of um, communicating with the dead, right? Um, or with death, yeah, with life and death. Um, they have this common local cosmology, right? And I have this, um, this mask, I bring this mask here from Southern Thailand with me, yeah? So like this, can you see? Yeah. So this is the clown actually from the Manura Long Crew. And it's a important picture. Um, there, so there's a whole puff of life, like a, like a theater almost, like a theatric, a theatric uh, uh, stage, yeah? Like a theater. And, um, and I just want you to, um, if, you, uh, if you can now, um, uh, mention some of the festivals, religious festivals or cultural festivals that are dear to you, that are important to you. So you can just, yes. Um, oh, uh, I, I'm not sure if I can see actually everybody. I have to change the... Gallery, okay, yes. So um, Adi Bula had a sign, hand sign. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, sorry, it's morning here, sorry. Eh? It's just uh, a quarter after seven here in the morning. Uh, I wonder what you want me to see, sir? I should make my contribution or I should give an uh, instance of uh, uh, a cultural value in my area? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, if I should go down the memory lane, uh, we used to have uh, what you call a Gumbu festival. A Gumbu festival is, uh, uh, used to be a renowned uh, culture. People from all over the world, they travel down home to celebrate this particular festival. And it is believed that if you participate, if you attend, our ancestral will bless you and then make your living, you know, uh, worthwhile. And, uh, you know, it is also a period where we do meet together to discuss about development generally in my place. So it's more of a ritual yearly thing that we do gather together and celebrate this festival. You have mass courage, that we so consumed and dance, entertain, food, and so many entertainments takes place. But, you know, as we have said in our last session, we are no longer closer to the root anymore. We are getting closer and remaining in the center now where we cannot, uh, you know, share this value with our people anymore. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing. Any, anybody else? Not now, then um, your ideas might, your associations might come uh, during the presentations. So I open my first presentation. Um, yes. Okay. 
Can you see? Can you see well the presentation? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, great. So um, the first part is a little bit biographical and is also related to the Corona pandemic. And I think that um, many of the um, uh, emotions that I share here with you are, um, are also, you can also associate with. Um, so uh, fresh wind for online academy. Um, so the first picture is uh, myself, right? I stand up, standing up against racism, discrimination, Islamophobia, and anti-Semitism. So we had a campaign here in the city of Bielefeld in Germany, right? And here I, I have this uh, sign, the signpost, right, uh, where I where I say I stand up, right? So um, and everybody, in, so 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 many people in Bielefeld did, right? And I think that's very important to show this kind of solidarity. And I say here for a, for a colorful, a colorful, diverse and open cosmo, cosmopolitan Bielefeld with dignity. This is written here, yeah? So we can choose the text and then we post it in the social media, yeah? Against the rise of, the, of populism and the um, extreme right, yeah? So, um, uh, in spring 2020, I've been a bit upset, upset uh, about very intensive and tiring online teaching. Yeah, and I think everybody uh, had this kind of experience um, um, of plunging a little bit into online teaching. Um, and after teaching a couple of years in Tallinn as associate professor, I was hit by a kind of melancholia that was amplified by the Corona pandemic and my inability to commute from Tallinn to my family home in Germany. Hence, I decided to take a sabbatical to write a monograph on vernacular humanitarianism among the Karen in Eastern Burma. So I've worked um, the last 10 years with the Karen, um, a minority in Eastern Myanmar, in Eastern Burma, right? But once I set foot in Germany, my appetite to teach beyond academia was constantly growing. So that is the phase that I find myself into now, speaking to you, yeah? Can you hear me well, everybody? Yes, yeah? doctor. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Yes, thank you. So I decided to find new ways of teaching beyond academia and to experiment with new formats of teaching workshops instead of conferences, yeah, doing workshops instead of conferences and to reach out to the public. I taught blending learning courses for participants with migrant and refugee background in Germany, reflecting on socialization, migration and integration and on culture and religious identities for social enterprise called Big Up, education, culture and participation. My participants came from many countries, including Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq. Many of the participants have graduated from university, but were not yet able to get a foot into, into the German, uh, German job market and were very vulnerable regarding their residency rights. I enjoyed greatly working with this group because I did not use academic language or jargon, but interacted actively with the participants in a dialogue and learned so much from the participants and got a fresh perspective on teaching, didactics and interaction. I had both faces teaching online and in person. Finally, I was inspired by people from the Wise Vote Needs Anthropologist Network. Yeah, it's a very active and dynamic association and network. And I encourage you to, take, to, to become a member if you, um, if you are um, interested who set up uh, online academies and anthropological think tanks, especially Hallo, Ethnographic Bureau by Luisa and Educera Alliance, a startup at the University of Oxford by Elita Bess. As I support a community center in Shan State in Myanmar, as I will talk later, um, I conferred with Elisabeth Rachman to give a masterclass on the premises of vote anthropology and peace culture. So this is forthcoming, yeah? A masterclass 
on the premises of vault anthropology and peace culture at Educere um, uh, uh, Alliance. And I will share the link with you in due course, yeah? I will share the link with the students in due course, okay? In the next step, I went even further. I collaborated with the social enterprise Cuba to design a six months education to become a cultural coach for young people, young migrants in Germany to become a cultural coach. We invited young people, especially Yazidi or Yazidi people from Northern Iraq, yeah, from Sinjar in Northern Iraq, um, who have become forced migrants in Germany, yeah, who actually fled uh, from genocide, from attempted genocide, yeah, in 2014. Um, and we have a big group um, of 100,000 people um, in, in the region of Bielefeld and, 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 the, uh, and the region, in the cultural clubs and associations in the living quarter. So that's very important, yeah, that this, this um, educational project is to become, is a training to become a cultural coach in your own living quarter. That means in Bielefeld Baumheide, for example, yeah, which is a small neighborhood, yeah, where you have a high concentration of migrants and a high concentration of Yazidi families, yeah. And the whole point is to become active, yeah? to become active um, in peace building, right? So we teach the methods and models to become an intercultural trainer, bridge maker, transversal enabler, or cultural facilitator. So what is a transversal enabler? A transversal enabler is somebody who is able to invest into social relations in a school or in a kindergarten, yeah? So that actually to improve the, the social climate, so to speak, yeah? For example, to have the school without racism, yeah? The school of courage. So that's what I'm now doing. So I'm becoming more creative and I have a lot of, um, you know, fun with that. <laughs> so I enjoy myself also. So the culture coaches work in different fields, including anti-racism, democracy promotion, and cultural education. So democracy promotion, what does it mean, right? It means that to enable and to encourage young people, young migrants to, um, uh, to participate in, um, in the local democracy, yeah? in the local democracy. Um, and, um, and this is uh, about rights, of course, also, yeah? To be more aware of your rights. So the aim is to create open spaces in the living quarter where problems of discrimination can be openly debated and action taken. So people experience discrimination on an everyday level, right? Yeah? And I encourage the young people to become um, cultural coaches to counter this, to counter this discrimination and racism. So it's a quite of empowerment, yeah? So I've successfully applied for a BAMF project now, um, which is a ministry, the German ministry, government ministry of um, migration and refugees, yeah, BAMF, yeah? And my project is called Hate Zone, countering hate speech in the internet. Yeah. So in a sun state, needs and coexistence. I integrate this with the master's program at V Erlang on the anthropology of decision making, integrating my new experiences with online teaching in my regular university teaching at FAO. So I am now, um, currently I'm a guest professor 
at the um, Friedrich Alexander University in Erlangen, yeah? And we have a master program in uh, which is called uh, Standards of Decision-Making Across Culture. So I'm working now in the university and outside of the university, yeah? At the same time, yeah? And having my food, so to speak, um, in, um, in the trainings, in local trainings, um, as I uh, outlined, and um, my um, international um, um, partnerships. So, so what I like to promote here with you is a concept that I like to call vote anthropology, all right? So the online courses include models on methods, including ethnography. But ethnography does not only mean participant observation. So um, anthropology is um, uh, very much associated with its main method, yeah, which is um, uh, participant observation, of course. Participant observation means that I don't stay in a hotel, right? But I stay actually with, um, with the people um, I visit and I share time with yeah, every day, the everyday life. Um, I share meals with, I sleep there, right? So um, meaning um, uh, I have a really uh, a meaningful interaction, yeah? But um, I think that participant observation, just physical, um, just being a guest, right? Just physical um, participation, is not sufficient, yeah? But um, we need what I call participatory action research. And, um, and this means that actually I use my resources um, as a relatively privileged white European, yeah? To participate in the human rights campaigns, for example, of the Karen, yeah? Because as I told you, um, I stayed many um, uh, <clears throat> many years um, in uh, ten years uh, during ten years in records, yeah, um, uh, with the Karen in Eastern Myanmar. So, um, first, the intercultural trainers learn about the profession to be a coach. The coaches facilitate um, conversations dialogue and cooperation. So now I'm coming back to the, uh, to the trainers um, uh, in Bielefeld, yeah, in Germany. Uh, the coaches facilitate conversations, dialogue and cooperation in the city living quarter. On the other hand, I was also interested in peace education and decolonizing strategies and in developing community centered and sensitive teaching materials on peace building. So, what I'm saying here is um, uh, that I'm that pa means yeah I said already I mentioned already that participant observation is key but it's not sufficient yeah so what does it mean what is the difference participatory action research it means that um, it is important to decolonize yeah um, uh, anthropology indeed yeah yeah. So otherwise there's a danger that we have a very strong American kind of uh, Anglo, yeah, American anthropology um, that uh, dominates, that, you know, dominates anthropology elsewhere, yeah? Also in the university, yeah? So we need a diversity of voices, yeah? We need a diversity of voices. We need the diversity of anthropologies, right? And we need to listen. We need to listen to the communities and, um, and incorporate, incorporate um, uh, the, uh, um, the expertise of the local communities in our teaching, in our teaching materials. You understand? Can you follow me? Yeah? Can you follow? Yes. Yes, yes, great. Yes, so, yes, yes, sir, yes, sir. yes, that's great. So, um, uh, 
so again, I cannot, I just want to repeat this, right? So we need um, developing community centered and community sensitive teaching materials on peace building, yeah? So we need to engage at the same time, and this is my whole point, yeah? In informal and as well as a formal uh, education, yeah? And we need to bridge this, yeah? Otherwise we, we just form an elite, yeah? And we exclude and marginalize most of the people who don't have the um, privilege of university education, let's say. You understand? Yeah. So that's so 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 very very important. Um, uh, and how can we do this? Uh, let's discuss together. So for me, it was important that I build on the experience and expertise of the communities and not come with solutions myself, the simplified solutions, yeah, yeah. So I don't come with ready kind of with, you know, surveys or questionnaires or this kind of stuff, yeah. I actually hate this, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, I rather, uh, the questions rather emerge in the field, yeah. I developed this idea of partnership in a recent paper on vote anthropology that I presented for the uh, IUEAS Congress. So this is a big anthropology Congress, yeah? I think that online teaching and learning offers a huge potential um, for using resources in transnational exchange and support network on high I, yeah? So, High I meaning mutual respect, okay? Um, so, uh, so let's use this online teaching um, and, and learning um, uh, material uh, technologies um, productively. The general idea is that neutrality in participant observation is not even desirable and probably a fiction, yeah? So let's don't try to, to say that we are neutral, yeah? Because we aren't, because we have very clear political positions, yeah? And, um, and if, we, um, if we join in the struggle for human rights, yeah, then this is positive, yeah? And so it's not necessary to hold back. Um, uh, but to, to be clear about um, our position, to be transparent about it. So ethnographic intervention always establishes a power relation. So there's, I also like to emphasize that there's a power relation as well. Yeah? I come as a university professor with all the resources, right? With all the resources of the uh, German government and, and, you know, we have scholarships and all this kind of stuff. Um, while the research, they have nothing, they have really, but I mean, they, they don't have this kind of means, you understand? They're very um, poor, but, um, but they are also very rich because they have um, local wisdom, yeah, they have um, local knowledge of what I like to call the expertise of the local communities. And, and actually, I want to change development, right? I want to change the rules, the game of development cooperation and the game of academic partnerships, right? And, um, and this came out in other presentations as well. Uh, I'm thinking about um, Albertus' work with Aboriginal people, for example, right? Yeah. So PA again is um, ethnographic fieldwork is always an intervention. So understand PA is commitment to the community. Yeah. So you understand it's not just um, I don't um, pretend. Yeah. To be neutral. Otherwise, people would also like Alberto talked about it actually. Right. Alberto talked about it how people were suspicious. Right. About the young researchers suddenly appearing in their uh, community, in their midst, right? Yeah, you understand? So 
if you hold back, if you don't say who you are, actually, yeah, people will become suspicious, right, about you, yeah. So it's better to say clearly who you are and why you are there, and also um, just uh, to, to remain passive, but to, to become active, to become an active researcher and engage in what I call social intervention. What does it mean, social intervention? It means that I know, I get to know the, the problems of the, of the current. I get to know the hardships, yeah? Because they have been, you know, they suffered from civil wars, they suffered from, from violence, from structural violence, from discrimination. They suffered from physical violence, yeah? In some villages have been, villages have been burned and some villages, the house have been, the school have been rebuilt seven times, right? So I get to know people's hardships, right? Yeah. And then I cannot just stay aloof, you understand? But I join people's campaign for their rights, yeah? And I'm in a good position to do so, right? So um, I understand par as commitment to the community I work with and contribute to social justice by participating actively in campaigns and mobilization. I wonder how this partnership could materialize in the virtual space, but I have, but I have hope that this could also be used as a public space and platform for civil action as well as for sensible teaching, yeah? So let's ex let's export this wonderful course, yeah, to all parts to all parts of the of the globe, yeah. <laughs> it's important, yeah. It's an important course, and I think it's just a wonderful idea, because Deep is also a wonderful network, and um, I'm also part of Deep, right? Um, uh, I will also talk about it. So um, in September October last year. Um, 2020, I taught for the first time a course on peace and development at UCHI in Castellón, Spain, at the UNESCO Chair of Peace Studies, right? And enjoyed it tr tremendously. Um, I enjoyed the interaction with the students tremendously. And even the context was fragile because um, we were still in the I don't know, maybe second wave, I think, right, uh, of the corona pandemic. It was my best university experience so far, I can say. And um, I'm really looking forward to teach this course in September, um, this coming September again. Um, and because, yeah, so, um, but I, I wonder now if I develop courses such as the international course on peace culture online, so that my students and friends everywhere can participate. Yeah, so I like to develop also like uh, courses online, such as a master's class uh, for Idocere Alliance, um, such as this course. Uh, frankly speaking, I also have to get used to online teaching as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, I think that um, it, uh, it offers us uh, um, huge opportunities. So deep, I want to speak about deep too. And I see that the talk of peace houses and community centers, where I could, uh, would also visit and teach regularly. Yeah. So within Deep, Alberto was so kind to um, um, support a circle. Yeah. So we have many circles in Deep, right? In the Deep Global Network, and I initiated a circle on peace houses and community centers. Yeah. And I intend to visit these um, peace houses and community centers uh, and. Um, and teach there. Um, so, and I like to teach there in peace education. For example, um, 
we have uh, currently, we have peace houses in Yangon, in Myanmar, in Patani, in Southern Thailand, in Bielefeld, this is the EBZ Friedenshaus, and in Sinja, in Northern Iraq. And so these are the places uh, I visited and engaged with, yeah, in my um, short academic career, right? <laughs> well, um, so uh, um, these are the places. And in Northern Iraq, for example, a friend of mine, uh, Mirza Diani, he has uh, received a, a, an award, a peace award also in Armenia. Um, he is actually Izidi, he's an Izidi intellectual, and he, um, he now um, uh, freshly built from, from scratch, uh, you know, you, you have to imagine in Sinja, all the uh, villages have been, all the houses have been destroyed, you know. So it's ruins, yeah, um, destroyed by the, um, in battles and uh, by the Islamic State. So um, Islamic State forces. So um, uh, including the cultural heritage, right? So like say religious temples. So now Mirza built um, a peace center there in Sinja, yeah? And people were saying, you are crazy, you know. Um, uh, um, the Turks might actually drop a bomb there, and then the, there will be no more peace center. Yeah, but he says no. He believes that this peace center can be an embryo of um, of uh, of a new kind of um, togetherness, of reconciliation, and of resil resilience, um, reconciliation and dialogue. Yeah. So, um, so very brave. Um, so I envision a combination of presence and online teaching and learning for the future. I think that we must seriously rethink and reconsider the university. This is a big word, I know. <laughs> but um, let's just try, right? So there are various ways of integrating, I think, NGOs and nonprofit enterprises into the regular coursework. This would require a sort of bridge making between university and civil society. The idea I like to bring forward is that the university uses its resources for service to society. So we don't, do not have only have to think about the format of the pedagogic and teaching materials, but also about the design of quick and efficient delivery of peace education among young people. Yeah. I already mentioned that we have to rethink the format of, of teaching, of the pedagogic and teaching materials. And you had wonderful presentations already, yeah, by Jennifer Murphy, uh, I think, yeah, uh, on, on, on peace building, peace education, uh, by Sofia Herrero, right? So, um, uh, there's no need to repeat this, um, but um, but my point is here the development of the teaching materials themselves. Yeah, they come from the communities themselves. Um, and also we have to, to think about more efficient delivery of peace education to the young people, yeah, at the community level, yeah. Um, so, because not really, uh, I, I cannot, I can just repeat, uh, I have to repeat it. Uh, and many universities, um, I, and I think I visited also um, uh, in Indonesia, right? I, in, in Yogyakarta, I visited the university in Yogyakarta, uh, Gajamada, right? And uh, I, I have very fond memories uh, of um, Yogyakarta, actually. Um, and presented my work there. And I know that the university there, also the Islamic University, um, Muhammadiyah, right? Are doing a wonderful job in reaching out, yeah? And this is, I think, what we need uh, to, to be more, uh, more inclusive. 
and less elitist. So we need, I argue, an online academy. Yeah? We need an online academy, and this could be a path-breaking tool. For the online academy, um, I develop models, which I call future labs, yeah, future labs. In these labs, the approach to the topic, for example, nonviolent communication is experimental and includes creative elements such as the, uh, theatrical, yeah. So theater is very important, performance is very important, yeah, and pedagogical exercises. I have now for a long time left the lecture for interactive and participatory teaching, yeah? So we don't need like endless lectures, but we need interactive and participatory teaching. In my experience, the students learn so much more if they participate in the learning experience. So I want to encourage participation by interactive teaching, the integration of pre-recorded video clips, digital learning materials that can be always opened and repeated um, you know, that students can always open and repeat for themselves, podcasts, workshops, vault cafe, and improcedure. Improcedure is uh, improvision theater, yeah? So it's not a kind of staged play, but it's a, it's a structured, pre-structured play, but it, it's open, right, for, for the contents um, to emerge. Okay, so... Uh, the Congress, that was the International Union of Anthropological and Ethnological Science, yeah, it's called, uh, which is also global in its scope. So I presented a paper on vote anthropology to IUAES, arguing that we cannot afford limiting ourselves to research or to ignore the power relations between the researcher and the researched. I suggest to become actively involved in campaigns and strategies for cultural rights and to listen to community and gender sensitive approaches, experience and expertise to peace education, to develop teaching materials on the space. To design teaching materials for quick delivery among young people and to create a notion of togetherness by adopting a polyphonic approach, a polyphonic approach, which means in which the voice of the researcher only one voice among many, yeah? My voice as a researcher is only one voice among many, yeah? So this will also include designing workshops in a digital format. I believe that the e-connection is the future, not only for the pandemic era, after or uh, in between the new pandemics. It allows me to bridge long distance, or it allows us to bridge long distances with people I've met and appreciated in person before. So it's very important that we meet in person, yeah? Online education cannot replace um, education in person, face-to-face, -face. it cannot, unfortunately, yeah? In my view, yeah? But I can um, build a bridge long distances with people I've met before, right? Yes. So, um, let me come back here. Um, so do you like to, um, first, do you have maybe questions of understanding or do you have um, a comments maybe to the first part of my, of my presentation? Does it speak to you? Uh, does it speak to you at all? Uh, no questions as of now, Professor. Thank you so much. You may continue. Thank you. Okay, then um, let's have... Um, uh, I have a, a second part of the presentation. Ellie, you know, um, because of the long announcement in the beginning, I now have uh, half an hour left. So what I like to do is actually um, to show a short video clip.
Yeah, let me do this. Uh, so first, I like to show this one. Can you see? Yes, yes, yes Professor. It's visible. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so this is um, uh, uh, a project I like to um, introduce. Uh, I, I, which I follow um, during the last uh, during the last years, um, especially in my time in, in Tallinn. And uh, this is in Estonian language, yeah, in Estonian language. And you can see, but I just want to, uh, you to see the, um, the picture of the uh, very cute children uh, in Shan State. And, um, and these people uh, suffered, yeah, from many, um, uh, 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 suffered from many violences. Uh, so from structural violence, from actual, from physical violence, right? From physical violence, um, they suffered from, uh, but they also suffered from development, yeah? Because after the, um, uh, the democratic uh, period um, beginning, let's say, uh, after the national elections in 2015, um, there, was, there, were, there was actually a Myanmar educational consortium in, um, in Myanmar, and, and, and they supported this Myanmar educational consortium, supported this wonderful local project here in Shan State, which is um, uh, um, uh, which is led by my by my wonderful uh, friend uh, Nai Sao Kam, um, uh, and he's a community leader. He has been a Buddhist abbot before, yeah. But he left um, the monastery. He left the monastery, and um, uh, and he has become a, a community leader, and. And he has built, um, can you imagine, 90, um, uh, 90, or he plans to build 90 uh, uh, primary schools, yeah? And he has built uh, already um, uh, 34, yeah? Um, and I think the number has now reached 50, 50 schools, imagine, yeah? And the community center, youth community center in Shan State, in Namlan, actually. Uh, which is up from Sipo, yeah, uh, in, um, in Myanmar. Um, I will show you a map also. And um, yeah, um, and this project, um, the, 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 um, uh, the kind of special quality of the project, yeah, the special quality of the project is support um, education in Shan language, yeah, and in Shan culture, so that actually the children can learn um, their own language and their own culture and their own history, yeah, because before this history has been stolen from, from the people in a way, yeah, and cultural heritage like palaces, etc., Shan palaces have been destroyed, yeah, have been destroyed um, to erase erase uh, Shan history, so to speak, yeah? um, by the central government, yeah? by the military regime at the time. And um, so um, the children, they, if they come to school now, right, they, they come to, into, into a Burmese school and then they have to learn in Burmese language. Yeah? So they may speak some Burmese language, but not, uh, they, are, they may not be proficient in, in Burmese language, right? Because their mother tongue, the vernacular language is Shan, right? Yeah, you understand? So, um, and then people, uh, the children are beaten for not uh, speaking um, uh, uh, Burmese language well. Yeah. And, um, and so this is so cruel. Yeah. And um, so, um, so establishing uh, Shan education is also about Shan identity, Shan cultural identity, yeah? So if we speak about peace and peaceful culture, yeah? We also speak about um, identity as well, cultural identity as well, yeah? That's very important, yeah? And that is the perspective of anthropology, yeah? Right? 
That is the perspective of anthropology to give full attention and full endorsement to culture. Yeah? And culture is very, very important. Yeah? Otherwise, if you have no culture, we are like empty. Yeah? So um, that's so important. Um, so to give uh, culture and you also give dignity to people. Yeah? Okay, and this is a homepage uh, I did with my, uh, my students. Um, and the students were very talented in setting up this homepage actually, they did all the work. Um, and, um, and we had a fundraising, uh, uh, fundraising events and the students also uh, volunteered yeah, with an NGO called Mondo, yeah, an Estonian NGO, very nice NGO. And they're doing very terrific work. And they volunteered with Mondo in, um, uh, in Namlan to support the, uh, the children. Yeah? And again, um, um, they didn't, uh, but they, they also worked with the children, but not as a role model, so to speak, yeah? but just as another teacher, you understand? Because um, the most important people are, of course, the Shan teachers right the local people because the local people again have the expertise yeah and that's my whole point yeah that's my whole point so um we as anthropologists we come to visit and we help um also to uh, to finance also um this um this project this help is uh, um the support is very welcome yeah it's very welcome um, of course, but uh, but the whole point is that we also um, um, uh, we we join uh, as a form of solidarity, and 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 thus um, uh, build this um, educational project together. Okay, in a partnership. All right, and I like to show a film. But uh, I will just show like a teaser, right? Um, uh, I will just show a teaser and just you, for you to have an impression of what Shunt State is like, yeah? Sorry, I lost you. Ah, uh, now I close this. Sorry. Well, I I will come back to this. I show you. I show you. A I show you the trailer of a film of a friend, actually, which is in the um, uh, Himalayas. Yeah. And then I will come back to Shan State. Don't worry, so I don't need your mercy. I'm going to go on my mind. 
Da Okay, so how do we like this film? I'm sure you want to see the whole film, right? Adibula, I cannot hear you. Yes. Yes, doctor, that was great. Yeah. Uh, that's a wonderful film and it shows the, the, the importance of the local cosmology here. Yeah, yeah? So it's about that the, the nature, the environment um, uh, is not owned actually by the people. Yeah? 
but by the spirits, by the deities. Yeah. So um, we cannot do harm to the environment because then um, the deities will actually punish us. That's what we see now with climate change, right? Yeah, with climate change. So because we are not careful enough with the environment, yeah, um, we also see the um, uh, consequences, right, of climate change. Yeah, and the consequences of climate change are dramatic. Right. So um, um, this, uh, I showed you this video clip. Um, it's a wonderful film of my friend Dance My You and Brass um, to again to emphasize the um, the local wisdom, the local knowledge, right, and the importance of religion and the local cosmology and of cultural identity, yeah, and how close people live with the environment. Okay, then. Um, uh, the following now for the time planning now um, uh, I suggest that um, we have now a small exercise in breakout, breakout rooms yeah if you are up to it and then we have a 15 minutes break yeah then we have a 15 minutes break and we come back for the second part of my presentation and then we can have the discussion on the basis of the presentations would that be a good plan Sure, doctor. Sure, sure. Would that be good? Yes, yeah? yes, we are okay with it. Okay or enthusiastic? <laughs> yes, sir. Enthusiastic. I want you to be enthusiastic. <laughs> so, uh, okay, great. Then uh, we have a small uh, exercise in breakout rooms. And uh, imagine um, now the task is um, the task is that you are um, um, a member of, imagine you are a member of um, um, uh, a deep circle on um, the anthropology of peace building, right? Of the deep global network, you are a member. Um, imagine you are a member and now you're going out um, to Shan State, to Namlan. Yeah, so the, the, the place I've been to. Um, and you want to help see um, in the future of the children. Yeah, you want to help the future of the children. So how would you, um, uh, can you please discuss in, in, in small groups now, just for 10 minutes, uh, what would be the steps that you would take um, to, uh, to help um, uh, with the education of the children in Shanstead, yeah? And I give you a little bit of the context already, right? So um, they suffered from uh, from structural violence, physical violence, as well from discrimination, but also uh, from land grabbing, for example. Yeah. Um, so uh, is the question clear? Alex, yeah? can I just in yes. intervene here? Yes. Just very quickly. Yes. Uh, I think the participants uh, do not know what deep circles because we we didn't talk about. No, that. so no, so you are. I, it's a, it's, I give... Yeah, please, please, please go ahead. <laughs> okay, so very quickly, um, what Alex I think assumed that uh, you are aware of how the deep network works. So the deep network includes a number of what we call deep circles, and these are small groups of volunteers, of change makers in different parts of the world. So Alex, for example, is the coordinator for the Peace House Circle. And um, some stage, you know, if we get the time, we will um, run through some of these circles, but you can look it up uh, on the deep web page. So a circle is essentially, uh, you know, a group. And we use the word circle because uh, the group does not really have leaders, but it's a circle. It's a kind of a, a group of people that get together. And in, in, this, uh, in, in this course, we have a number of people who are actually, they have their own circle. So we have Dilavar, for example, and Najiba, who belong to their, you know, in Pakistan. So what the circle does is they come up with their own projects, their own, um, the projects are focused on peace building, conflict transformation, social justice, uh, you know, 
dealing with structural violence, a whole range of different kinds of topics. So think of the circle as if like it's like a web where we bring together people who are like-minded, people who in fact, uh, usually they are friends and friends get together and they say, okay, let's, let's work on this. Let's try to do something to make a change happen in a particular kind of a setting. So I think this is what uh, Alex is inviting you. Is that right, Alex? Yes, inviting you right. to, to to the Shan country and and to to think as if like you are setting up a circle, but you know dealing with uh, what sort of projects that you're going to organize or run. Would that yes, yes would that yes. be my correct? Uh, Absolutely. So um, let's we take deep. Uh, you can also be here with UNICEF, for example. Uh, yeah, let's say UNICEF is very well known. Um, uh, United Nations, United Nations organizations that works with children. Yeah, um, you can. You, it's up to you. It's up to the to the uh, small group. So we will have um, small groups in. Um, um, of five people, five students, and and then I will join the groups also. Yeah. Degree, must degree. Yes. Bisa. Bagi kelompok lima orang ya. Ya lima orang, lima orang setiap. For how many minutes, sir? Ten minutes, please. Ten minutes. Okay. Sepuluh minit ya. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. In room together, and then I make an announcement. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So we now. Okay. Good. Ah, I think hello. Yeah. Still yeah. Ah, hello, everybody. I hope you had a good discussion. And um, the whole point actually is about um, uh, introducing PAR again. And so I will come back to this after the break. Also, uh, participatory action research. The whole point is um, to. Um, to take the uh, the community actually as the first priority, yeah. So to work with the community is the first priority, yeah, and not to work with any stakeholder, yeah, um, uh, um, with with you know uh, with all the with UNICEF or uh, with the government, etc. Yeah, but um, but to go to the community first, right? And to work actively with the community um, uh, together to empower the community, but uh, so so that was the whole point of the exercise. Um, and uh, and the the exercise is very interesting. Yeah, I did the same exercise in um, um, in Castellón, and students came up with um, uh, with very interesting diagrams. Yeah. Uh, about the different stakeholders they want to work with. Um, uh, but most students didn't go directly to the community, which is interesting. Yeah? So, um, okay, let's have uh, now a break of 15 minutes. And then uh, let's, um, let's continue with the second part of my presentation after the break, yeah? Are you fine with that? Yes. yes. Okay. And so let's come back to the let's come back to the um, to the discussions to the discussions you had in the breakout rooms, and then we have the second part of the presentation. Okay. Have a nice break, please. Thank you. All right. See you in uh, fifteen minutes. Have some tea or coffee, um, something nice. <laughs> Thank you. 
hope everybody's all right. I hope everybody everybody's back and that you enjoyed your break and that you are still full of enthusiasm for the course. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, let me ask you um, uh, about the um, discussions you had in the group. Um, so for the first group, uh, what kind of um, stakeholders, um, so you imagine you are with DEEP or with UNICEF, let's say, yeah? um, the United Nations organizations that have children, with what kind of stakeholders you would like to work with and how would, you, how would be the first steps you would, be, you would take after your arrival in Chan State? So who likes to share from the first group? I do not remember my group. Yes, Afa, Afila. This is the lower time. I can go first, but I don't yes, remember. Yes. I don't remember uh, group name, number. Yes. Actually, we, yes. we had discussion, uh, extensive discussion. Uh, yes. So both both uh, the steps, uh, which has been shared by the group members and some of the stakeholders, the steps in in uh, the steps that which which were shared in the group, uh, which can be taken uh, to eliminate the uh, discriminative behavior amongst uh, the society for children, which Wait, is the creative yes. expression. Creative expression can be one of the main source, which includes arts, music, painting, sketching and uh, yes. educating the uh, to educate the educators uh, and uh, also to provide the informal education opportunities to children engaging yes, all relevant stakeholders welcome to the stakeholders later and al also one of the group members uh, shared that the engaging teacher and elders in the community influential are uh, mandatory because they are someone who can who can own the the, the entire idea Hmm. And they can maintain it for beyond the project life it, if it is the uh, if it is funded project. And the most important thing, one of the members said that uh, we have to uh, to to reflect on the content which has been uh, uh, taught in schools and education system, or uh, young people or the children are taking it from the society, uh, society and family. We have to deconstruct the symbol and language if they are uh, supporting violent behavior amongst the children. And uh, uh, one of the uh, members said that we, we need to reconnect children to the nature because nature itself has a sense of peace, love, and compassion. Sure. And the major stakeholders which has been uh, shared by the group member are uh, parents, mainly the family, immediate family uh, care caregiver uh, or parents teachers, <clears throat> government education department, and uh, community influencers. And in some of the area, which are uh, tribal areas, like in Pakistan, there we have to consult the tribal leaders. Uh, these, these, these were uh, some discussion that we had in our group. And I thank you to every member of the group. They have provided me opportunity to share. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very rich already. Lovely. Um... How about Irfan? Irfan, you want to present uh, the discussions you had? Okay. Uh, uh, I'm representing group number two. Uh, yes, uh, in our group, we uh, jointly discussed and uh, some of the uh, group members have elaborated that uh, uh, a trickle effect, I mean, like from top to bottom, I mean, like from the policy level to, I mean, like a district level and then to the community. Yes, and uh, some, uh, some course, I mean, some uh, in, uh, area, it's true that uh, it, it, it helps a lot, but generally it depends on the area and locality. Like, for, for example, if we can talk uh, about Pakistan as a case, and then we take further to a tribal districts. So first of all, you will need to look at the dynamics of the area. So being as a developmental practitioner, as a peace activist, uh, and as a teacher of peace and conflict, 
working from the last 10 years in the community development sector, uh, the approach is that we start from the grassroots level. And in the grassroots level, it is very important that there are a few uh, uh, indicators that we need to set before going into the dialogue or discussion on any issue. So there are a lot of issues, for example, in a tribal district, uh, we do have the issue of, uh, um, I mean, like the um, uh, provision of clean drinking water, uh, uh, education, and other uh, basic facilities that are the uh, dire need of the human. So in that case, first of all, uh, we need uh, to, I mean, like call a, a meeting in a, that community, in the area, we ensure to include all the groups, whether that is, a, I mean, like sectarian area. So we need to include the Shia, the Sunni. We need to uh, include the uh, marginalized groups, uh, for example, the um, vulnerable uh, par uh, participants or uh, the other uh, non-Muslim who are living side by side. Then uh, we, uh, most of the cases, we used to do uh, a mediating role, just because that whenever a project comes, I mean, we have been working with various projects, but that was for a, 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 a very short span of time. And there are two things. One is uh, development and sustainable development, and one is sustainability. So NGO sector, uh, development sector, they always uh, uh, push for sustainability. I mean, like the project activities and beyond that when you phase out, but uh, actual the sustainable development. Sustainable development means that we need to empower the local community. They have a lot of problems. So in that case, we first need to get their consent to list down their main issues and then prioritize what are the common main issues. On that main common main issue, we right. used to get all the required uh, in, information. Mm -hmm. And then we try to reach to a conclusion, to an agreement uh, that fits locally so that we can find a local solution to a local problem. Second yeah. step, we used to engage these local community elders, religious elders, elected members, youth, uh, teachers, like earlier, the Lava Khan said that these are the primary stakeholders in a community who knows their real problem. And then we used to engage them, connect them, big, build a linkage with the district administration. In our All culture, right. in, in if our it's culture, possible, if it's possible. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. In our culture, uh, we do have that. Uh, Carl, we call it Kuli Kacheri, open discussion. So oh, okay. the, deputy, the, the deputy commissioner, and along with the deputy commissioner, there are law enforcement agency, police, there are the social welfare, and all the relevant department, health education, public health engineering. Uh, so they used to sit there, and they, then, then an open discussion starts. So the, the list of uh, issues that we identified in the local community, one, one of the uh, elder, they, uh, trans they translate, they highlight those issues, and then the deputy commissioner try to uh, accommodate their concern through annual development project plans and uh, through the relevant department to look at these issues for immediate, uh, um, I mean, course of action. And for some issues, right. they get time. So All this right. is a kind of a thing that we not only uh, bring out the basic issues and uh, consent from the local community, engaging and participation, and then connecting with the district administration for a, a immediate uh, ready meal actions. And that not only helped to build trust between the district administration, government, and the local community, but it also helped uh, to, I mean, like to, to, to reach their voices to the district administration. So this is the, the normal procedure that we used to do in our projects right. because uh, because uh, we don't we don't want to um, uh, create a fake expectation in a community because project GIZ UNICEF right. UNDP there for a short time of frame and then later mm. on they phase out but after phase out what will happen the sustainability we we usually uh, in, in, uh, empower and then connect to the relevant I mean uh, technical cadres and different departments so that they can live and survive yourself. Thank you also for giving insights from your own culture. I think uh, which is very important is that we engage the community from the beginning already in the design of the project itself, right? And also um, what was mentioned was also to work uh, by, by some participants in the, in the breakup rooms 
uh, is to involve parents as well, which I find very important. Yeah, um, and um, uh, and say to to uh, to be clear about the expectations also um, and the, and the dreams and hopes and aspirations. Yeah, future aspirations. This is also very important. And one 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 yes. extra point I would like to add. Uh, uh, working in the conflict zone or in, in, in the normal zone, uh, the most important thing is the social cohesion, bringing social cohesion among exactly. the diverse, diverse community. So yeah. the, this, this action, this methodology, this uh, uh, mechanism helps uh, that the department, the district uh, administration know the problems of people. So they take ownership and when they take ownership, then it minimizes uh, the, I mean, like the eruption, the re-eruption, or what we escalation of these conflicts in the community because they get a kind of a hope. So, I mean, it, it helps in peace building process as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And Rafia wanted to add? Uh, yes, Professor. So, yes. Um, yeah, we were, I also discussed the Ledra experiment model while we were, you know, brainstorming as to which approach we should apply in order to build peace. So I, we know that in the Ledala experiment model, we have, have three tiers of leadership. We have the top leadership, the middle range leader, leadership, and the grassroots leadership. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, I mean, this is my own, um, you can say, uh, my own uh, approach. I think the middle range leadership is, is most important while mm -hmm. focusing on any peace building process, because it's the middle range process that is connected with both the top leadership and the grassroots leadership. And if we focus on the construction of, uh, you know, more and more peace commissions, if we train people in conflict resolution, you know, if we encourage, encourage indigenous um, forms of peace building mechanisms, like we have Jirga in Afghanistan, Pakistan, we have the Panchayati Raj institutions in India, I think that it's, it's a long way to go. So focusing more on problem solving workshops, that too in the middle range leadership, it will help us you know, to better approach uh, peace building. Yeah, so we need something like organic civility. I write in the chat uh, the term. It's also a term that uh, Alberto Gomez, by the way, introduced, uh, I remember, organic civility and um, solidarity, yeah? And we also had Irfan said uh, cohesion. Exactly, also, yeah? exactly, exactly, Professor. So, so organic uh, civility and solidarity, meaning that the uh, organic means that the um, initiative has to come from the community itself. Yeah, so it's very important that they keeps control also of the process. That the community keeps control of the process of education. Yeah, that they can design the education in the way that they want. Yeah, and they aspire. Okay, great. Thank. Thank you very much um, indeed. And now I come. Uh, oh, uh, sorry, Adibola had his hand also. Yes, Adibola? Yes. Thank you. Sorry, thank you, Professor. Uh, from my group, uh, we had some conclusion, uh, which I will summarize. Uh, since, uh, since Deep Network is coming as a community based organization or a sort of NGO, uh, we need to start from what you call chapter diplomacy. Uh, this have to involve uh, actor transformation uh, because these children are coming from the background of violence, both physical violence, exactly. cultural violence, and exactly. uh, you know, cultural violence. Exactly. exactly. So we're going to engage in three hours, which have to be the first thing to rehabilitate these children. Uh, rehabilitation takes different form. Having done that, we need to reintegrate them and the final phase is rejuvenation. Yeah, we cannot do this in isolation from the environment. Therefore, we must engage the locals, the parents, and then foster peace education in them. Uh, we must also uh, need to, we need to, we also need to, uh, to inculcate the habit of ensuring that uh, we give them peace education, a lasting peace education that can transform their, 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 whatever they have experienced, a sort of conflict transformation processes. We need to give them peace education so that they will not reverse back to what has led them into that situation. And the transformation is not going to focus only on these children because uh, they know they are, they are they know they are vulnerable. But you must, you know, also address issue of uh, actor specific 
those who actually initiated the conflict that the children are suffering from. So from here, uh, they can be transformed and they live in a better society. Perfect. Thank you. To go also in the direction of conflict transformation already, which I really like. Yeah? Um, and uh, Toba? Uh, yes. Yes. It is Tuba. Uh, I was in group five, I think. I don't remember the number with Abdullah Alai, John Fong, and myself. We are three people in that group. And we discussed that according to John, we have firstly to assess the problem or relationship between two conflictual parties. And then, uh, according to Abdullah, reconciliate or untangle. Like I, the untangled was my point of view and Abdullah Ali was like we reconciliate the problem first assess them assess the problem that reconciliate that try to untangle the deep roots and for deep solution and deep from deep peace in that area so that is the points we come with thank you thank you thank you very much thank you very much indeed um, all, this, all this is very rich, yeah, and you can see um, how valuable uh, par participatory action research is, yeah, and that's the whole point I want to stress, and I shared some, um, some experiences with Alberto also, um, this is um, his work with the uh, Aboriginal people, yeah, um, but now let me go uh, um, also about um, potential conflict, yeah, with, um, by the way, uh, potential conflict with um, the government, for example, the government of Myanmar has neglected education for so long. Um, but now uh, let me go in the second part of the presentation. Yes. Great. Here you are. <laughs> so peace culture and culture of peace, non-Western epistemology and decolonizing peace education and vote anthropology. So I think I've been a little bit ambitious today. Um, so let me go through the slides rather quickly. Uh, so we can have a good discussion in the end also. Okay. Um, so we have the writing culture debate that has sensibilized us about the power relations in the field. Instead of coming with fixed questions, we should be open for the research question emerging in the field, yeah? So don't come with um, kind of uh, fixed questions, but be open for the themes emerging. And the themes emerging are given to you by, for example, the Aboriginal people. Um, uh, so I already said that I argue that vote anthropology does not see neutrality as desirable, right? And that uh, the researcher is committed to the communities he works with. So empathy is very important, yeah? Yeah, so participant, uh, uh, participatory action research path goes beyond uh, uh, participant observation, okay? And we like to use the resources of the researcher, I already said, right? And it's very important to be polyphonic um, versus uh, dialogic. dialogic um, so polyphonic uh, research is uh, preferred, right? Um, in which the researcher's voice is only one voice among many, and in which voices of interlocutors are stressed by extensive citation. Yeah. So let's include, be, be as exclu inclusive as possible also in our publications. So I don't, um, after publishing a book, for example, I go back to the field to discuss also the book with my um, uh, interlocutors, with the communities I work with, 
because uh, to also to test, you know, if, if, if what I have published speaks with to the community, yeah? And this is a very enjoyable moment also, yeah? It's a kind of party also, yeah? Uh, very interesting. And people see the photographs, you know, in the book and, oh, that's us and, you know, and uh, it's really um, uh, a really nice um, form of sharing. So we, have, we also have Western biases, yeah? And these um, Western biases also exist in peace education. Yeah. And this is very important to realize. Yeah. So we have to reflect from Western that Western concepts of peace suffer sometimes from universal assumptions, like even like human rights that can be really very hard and difficult to apply in the local context. Yeah. Only if we can apply them in the local context, um, like vulnerability. Then, um, uh, then uh, um, local rights, uh, human rights can be meaningful. Yeah, um, you know, if they, if you cannot apply them, um, then um, uh, they just stay uh, abstract. So, um, For human rights to be relevant, the research needs to be embedded in community concerns, yeah, community experience and design. And these are the ethnographic challenges, yeah. Um, so I'm looking now at developing non-Western epistemologies, yeah, you understand. So we need to, to decolonize development on three levels, on the level of theory and research, right, on the level of pedagogics and on the level of uh, practice. Yeah, the stake for vote anthropology is to elucidate non-Western community-centered approaches to peace in one vote to, for informing contextualized and gender-sensitive peace education and teaching materials. So, so now here comes yeah, and I can send you uh, the PowerPoint if you like after the after the presentation. I can send you the PowerPoint in a PDF. Yeah. So a vote anthropology is primarily interested in developing non-Western, community-centered, and gender-sensitive concepts. All right. It's very important. The non-Western is also very important, and the community centers is important as well. A vote anthropology explores non-Western epistemologies by employing vote ethnography with communities on the move. Yeah. The vote anthropology is not limited to participant observation or thick description, but includes commitment, empathy, and social intervention. Ethnography creates a climate of togetherness. A global anthropology includes local and international ethnography, spanning continents. For studying mobility, both temporal and spatial aspects are crucial. So for example, for the Karen, right? The Karen, they, they fled um, for their lives, to the uh, refugee camps, yeah? And they stayed, and many stayed like for 20 years, family stayed, imagine for 20 years in a camp, yeah? So the children, their children have only known the refugee camp. And from the refugee camp, there were many were about 100,000 people were resettled, many to the United States, yeah? So I, as a researcher, I also spent time in the refugee camp as well. And then I spent time, let's say, in Utica, in New York, in the state of New York, yeah, because you have a very substantial Karen community there. Or in Sheffield, you have a very active uh, Karen community in Sheffield, in England, in U the UK as well, yeah. A vote anthropology applies anthropological concepts and ethnographic methods to the real vote and use them to contribute to eco-peace systems. A vote anthropology is attentive to an encouraging of local knowledge and the expertise of the local community and the stake of fortifying local communities. Yeah, we have questions to this.
voice is rather clear. So what we like to develop are, we like to support people in the development of their eco peace systems, yeah? Because ecology and peace is very closely related, right? And, um, and people have local knowledge, believe me, people have a lot of local knowledge um, uh, on the environments. They know all the species, they know all the herbs, yeah? And, and these are vital in their, in their everyday lives, in their everyday food also, yeah? In their everyday food culture, right? So um, most things you don't need to, uh, to, um, to buy on the market because you can, just collect it in a sustainable way. And um, people also repair, you know, the environment constantly, yeah? Without actually the international organizations noticing, yeah? And people also repair their life roads after conflict as well, yeah? The Karen, they built their, their, their villages in a way now that they can be mobile because their, their villages have been destroyed so many times, yeah? So they use building materials that they can, um, uh, you know, buy the houses quickly, uh, build the houses quickly or rebuild, or uh, rebuild them in, in a different location. Also, they, um, in the refugee camp, the current people, they try to make, um, as to you as a refugee camp by so I already introduced the term here organic solidarity and peace culture in southern Thailand. So in southern Thailand, a unique culture has evolved on the basis of ritual exchange for the ancestral deities. Manuralong Kru is a ritual in which the living have an opportunity to meet the dead through possession by spirits, keeping modernity spirited and in charge. Modernity provides a basis for transversal enablers investing into social relations, avoiding tensions and keeping relations across ethnic and religious boundaries peaceful. And this is uh, Southern Thailand, yeah? This year you can see Songkla and Patani, yeah? Um, and uh, Southern Thailand bordering Northern Malaysia here, yeah? And the oceans, of course, yeah? Um, the Andaman Sea as well as the Gulf of Thailand. Okay, and here you have a, a picture from, um, from my fieldwork, yeah? The ritual of two religions. So you have here, can you see the um, Muslim Imam, yeah? The Muslim uh, Islamic community leader, yeah? Together with the Buddhist monks, yeah? Praying, exchanging, praying gestures, yeah? Exchanging food, money, and praying gestures on the common cemetery where both Buddhists and Muslims actually have been buried. Yeah. And this is uh, in, uh, a picture from Bantamut in Patalung province in Southern Thailand. Okay. So very impressive. And here you can see a picture of the Manuralong crew, where I said uh, the dead are invited to converse with the living. Yeah. And and it doesn't matter. Some of the relatives are actually Buddhist and some are Muslim in one family. You see. And thus, there is no separation here in this in this ritual of of Theravada Buddhism and Islam. Yeah, because what is more important is a local cosmology. Can you see the picture? 
Yes, Professor. Yes, Doctor. Yes, yes. Yes. And then we have the Karen. And I cannot speak about all the uh, traditions of the Karen, but the Karen are Buddhist, animist, and Christian, Christianized. And the Christianized Karen are looking back at the history of 200 years of missionization. And they have received the gospel from the American Baptist missionaries, actually. Yeah. And here you have a picture of Burma, yeah, and the South Asian Massif, yeah, meaning the mountains, yeah? um, the Himalayan, um, the extension of the Himalayan um, in um, yeah, uh, southern China, as a Burma bordering southern China, bordering Thailand on the Salavin River. All right, it's always good to have a map. And I said that the Karen suffered from civil war. And there were nine, nine refugee camps and resettlement. And this is a refugee camp, yeah, the Mela refugee camp in Northwestern Thailand, where I actually started my field work. Yeah. And I remember I did a lot of uh, I did I joined uh, the English class, yeah, the English language class. And I played football and table tennis yeah, with young people. And, and we always had um, new reunions to, um, to discuss the issues coming up, right? Um, so uh, small circles of discussion, and I, I found them very meaningful and important in the refugee camp. And you can see here the houses, yeah? It looks like a village, right? And the people that took their pastors, their Christian pastor with them and built a church in the refugee camp. Yeah. So to have a, a hope in the context of despair, right? And engagement is really important. And I was already talking about the project I had with the students, yeah? Where the students volunteered. And then we have the Yazidi people in northern Iraq, and they suffered from um, attempted gen genocide in 2014. And, and from um, violence, uh, from physical violence and as well, especially with the women. And so there's now a process of healing of trauma because um, the women have to uh, live with their trauma uh, they're highly traumatized, yeah, you know, because of um, they've been kidnapped, they've been enslaved, they've been raped, you know, multiple times. Yeah. And, and this is the, um, a picture of, of, a, of a Yazidi temple, because the Yazidi have their own Yazidi religion, yeah, and it's a very old religion, it's older than Islam or Christianity. And um, so, uh, so the Yazidi have a, a history of persecution, you know, a history of persecution, so that the trauma is actually transferred from one generation to the next. Yeah, and you have a very substantial um, Yazidi migrant population in Bielefeld, where I stay with my uh, family. So they're looking, Yazidi people are looking back at 72 uh, genocides, yeah? Um, so the, the genocide here, the, it took place on the third, the verse uh, on the 3rd of August, 2014. And the Yazidi were encircled by the Islamic states. Tens of thousands of people escaped to the rugged mountains without water or food, um, but 10,000 were not able to escape. And old men and boys were all killed. Yeah. 7,000 women and minor girls were raped, enslaved, and sold like sheep. And hundreds of women remained caught in jihadist families in Syria and in Turkey. So, but then there was also solidarity and help from Kurdish forces from Rojava, from Northern Syria, yeah? 
and many of the fighters of the um, of the Kurdish um, forces uh, are actually women. Um, and this is a picture of the mass grave. And now there's a very difficult um, uh, part of reconciliation. And I already uh, introduced uh, the peace, uh, the community center, yeah, um, in Sinja, yeah, that is being built. And the opening of the, of the uh, community center will be in September, October, yeah. And you're very much invited to join. And this will be in northern Iraq, in Sinjar. So, and then you have the diaspora. And the diaspora, um, you have diasporas now uh, from, um, from the Ezidi uh, people, of course. Um, uh, diaspora, meaning people living, migrants living in exile, yeah, forced migrants. Uh, you have diaspora from the Patani Malay diaspora in Hamburg, also in Germany, in Stockholm, in Sweden. And, um, and you have the Karen diaspora, um, but very uh, small community in Germany, but uh, but Karen uh, diaspora uh, can be found in, in Scandinavia, especially in Norway. So for the conclusion, a world anthropology differs from global anthropology in that the global anthropology studies transnational or global networks, right? While the world anthropology that I introduced today encompasses people in various places, including the diaspora relating to violent displacement and refugee communities in the one world in which we live together. A world anthropology integrates anthropological fieldwork and the application in peace building education and training. The inclusion of the communities we work with starts with the research design and becomes meaningful by creating togetherness and a commitment using power. Further, the spirit of inclusiveness and social cohesion is further strengthened by engaging in common activities and campaigns and by de developing community-centered and culturally sensitive concepts and teaching materials. Yeah, that was a point I stressed yeah, again and again. We need to develop community-centered and culturally sensitive concepts and teaching materials. Yeah, we don't want to work with teaching materials that are offensive actually to the cultures and traditions of the communities, right? The goal of a world anthropology is to overcome Western epistemologies and Western domination of knowledge by bringing both the research design as well as the implementations for further learning into one world anthropology. This world anthropology does not see the refugee community as a subject to be observed, but tries to make the community and its knowledge visible and facilitates this process by using the available resources and expertise. Yeah, a vote anthropology does not see research and applied anthropology as distinct entities, but intervention of some sort of a social justice creates trust and confidence in the field and solid research at the grassroots level, guarantees uh, the quality of, uh, of the training in peace education or peace building and conflict transformation. A vote anthropology promotes dialogue and cooperation. Yeah. So again, confidence in the field, solid research at the grassroots level guarantees the quality of the training in peace education and peace building. In this case, a global anthropology or world anthropology is to overcome the distance between the researcher and the people by not only showing to our, our solidarity with the people, not only showing our solidarity, but to discover that we have the same values about life, love and peace and dreaming about a better world. We identify the same problems with destruction of the environment, climate change, human rights, and the use of brute force to exclude, humiliate, or eliminate. On this basis, on this human basis, it does not matter anymore if I come from Berlin, Pa'an, or Sinja. Thank you very much for your attention.
Okay, now we have um, plenty of time for questions or comments to the presentation, to the second part of the presentation. Did everybody understand the meaning of vote anthropology now? Is this something that you can identify with? Maybe Alberto can share also some of his experiences uh, with, uh, with Aboriginal people, Alberto. Hi. <laughs> you put me on the spot. Yeah. Yes, yes. What? Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, in, fully agree with you, I should say, about the role of anthropology. I think um, uh, Alexander knows this as well, because there are one of the things in the training of anthropology, and I, I recall this very well, is that our so-called professors would say to us that the role of an anthropologist is to be objective. It's a scientific study. We must not make moral judgments. It's amoral. Um, so you just go into the field, you observe the people, you write about them, and don't intervene in the lives of the people. So as if like they are, you know, being a, a scientist, you know, as if like the people that we are studying are very much like, uh, you know, laboratory objects, you know, for us to observe and write about and then contribute. And I always found it very difficult uh, to do this. Uh, and the anthropologist Roger Keesing, the late Roger Keesing, who was one of the professors at uh, ANU where I did my PhD, he puts it very nicely. He says that a morality that is not to take a moral stand is ultimately immorality. So the point he was making was that as an anthropologist, and I found it really difficult in the sense that if I'm going to, to, you know, to live with people who have been marginalized, people who are suffering the various sorts of consequences of being dominated or oppressed, and I felt that I just couldn't sit there and do nothing. And so I took a stand from a very early stage in my research that while I will observe and try to be as objective as I can, but ultimately I had to take a stand. And it's always been uh, a stand where I would be alongside the Orangasi. If you are interested, uh, I'd be happy to share uh, a paper that I wrote quite recently, it's entitled Anthropology, the Politics of Indigeneity. It is the text uh, of a keynote address that I gave, I can't remember, I think it was 2010, where I, uh, there was a big conference of New Zealand, Australia, and the International um, Union of Anthropological Sciences. So they had a joint conference in, in Western Australia, in Perth, and the Australians uh, picked me as their representative of the keynote, and then the the others, you know, they, they picked uh, the other organisations picked various people, and I shared the same panel as this really distinguished uh, Maori uh, scholar, Maori historian, by the name of Dame, uh, and well, she's Dame now, but and. Uh, and Salman, and she is, you know, incredible. Anyway, uh, back to my experience with the Orang Asli. When I was living in the area, I, I, okay, now I can make it public because I don't really care, you know. But <laughs> when I was in in the field, the the assistant district officer of the Tapa area was one of my classmates in the university. And when I was sitting with him one day in the district office, I learned that the government was in the process working with various corporations to demarket certain areas within the Orangasli communities. And there are 28 villages in the whole region. And they were going to carry out what they, they went to 
tell the orang asli that they're carrying out surveys. But the survey was actually meant to demarcate certain areas, restrict the orang asli to much smaller areas than they have, uh, than their, their homelands that they claim uh, on, the, on the grounds that, uh, that, you know, we, well, what they, what the government was interested in, in was to, to free up the land for commercial, uh, so the corporation, so there was some corruption that was involved. So this uh, assistant district officer told me about this, thinking that, oh, you know, uh, I'm his classmate, but I betrayed him because I got the information and I went and informed uh, all the Orangasli from the 28 communities because I felt that my, uh, as an anthropologist, uh, you know, my, I, I have solidarity with the people who have been marginalized. So I got a few of the headmen in the area and we organized a big, uh, a big meeting of all the headmen in all the 28 um, villages. And we all got together and we had this, you know, this meeting. And at the meeting, uh, there were a number of Orang Asli who were in fact uh, working for the police. They were special branch uh, police officers. And so I turned to them and I spoke to them in Samai. I said, I know that you are here representing the police. And I know that if you go to and report me for what I've been doing here, then uh, I will be immediately arrested and detained without trial. And I will be considered to be a threat to the internal security. So that was the issue. And I said, to them, it's up to you. If you want to report, I'll be put away. But that's, you know, I'm doing this not, not for anything apart from helping your people. And fortunately, they did not report me. But I knew that I was being as, as an, I mean, I felt I was not doing anything illegal. I felt that, you know, as an anthropologist. But from then, I knew that I was uh, under surveillance. My phones were tapped. Uh, I was, uh, you know, on many occasions being, uh, I know that, you know, when I'm giving a speech, even my lectures, I had special branch officers sitting there watching uh, what I was doing. And then some of you would have heard, you know, some famous Malaysians. I mean, people like Lim Kik Siang, and they were all people that I knew. And even like Jomo Sundram was also one person in, in this uh, group of people. So then in October, 1987, uh, on the 27th, I think in October, 1987, I got a call in the morning from one of my friends who has got very close links with the Malaysian government. And he said to me that my name is on the list and at two o'clock in the morning, they're gonna come and arrest you. And so, uh, and he su suggested that I should go and hide in the forest. And I said to him, look, if they're gonna arrest me, they're going to arrest me. So that night I didn't really sleep uh, at all. And I knew every car that went past the home, I knew that, uh, yes, that's right, John is the Operation Lala. Lala. So Ku, uh, Kwa Kya Sung, all these people who I was friends with and you know they got arrested. And uh, Lim Guan Eng and all those. Anyway, so I was uh, in you know 1987, but I think, from what I, I gather is that my name was like 120. So I was not, <laughs> I was not uh, important enough to be arrested immediately. And they arrested 101 people, took them away, detained them under our Internal Security Act. And uh, that I remember that morning, you know, hanging out with several of my friends and even now and then, several of them are in politics now, like Siva Rasia and all those people but anyway we and, and even, even Anwar Ibrahim sorry thank I have to thank you so much for sharing your experience and it shows also how sensitive actually our uh, exactly. ethnographic work is um, uh, because it's about um, rights and it's about politics and it can be uncomfortable for some of the uh, elites actually um, oh, yes, exploiting them uh, so um, uh, for the end i like to just show a one minute teaser for a wonderful wonderful documentation of the 
situation in Shan State. Um, uh, just to give you a last kind of impression, and then uh, we can close, uh, I better can close the session, yeah? So one sure. minute teaser, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, because you have um, in Shan State, you have a tradition of oral singers. Actually. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Please. Yes. So, yes, so okay. you have a. Yes. You have a oops. Uh, now I have a strong echo. Okay, you have a tradition of uh, oral singers. Yeah. So this is oral poetry. What happened now? Okay, good. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, you have these oral singers and they uh, carry the uh, local wisdom with them in the songs actually and, and, and give them to the next generation. And it's very beautiful, yeah. Um, so unfortunately, I have to close the session today. And uh, uh, so, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I have to, I have to uh, end my presentation and I, I give it to, um, to the local organizers of the course uh, to close the session. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. It's always a pleasure to to have you speak, but it's also you know always a pleasure to have a fellow anthropologist anthropologist. And sometimes you're so close to our discipline that we forget. So there are certain things about uh, anthropology that I have kind of put it left behind. Uh, and uh, but thank thank you. Thank you so much for you know devoting your time. And Mas Ari? Yes, sir. So okay, I can see there are some two person raised their hand. Should we? Yes. Okay. Uh, Kafir? Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, uh, hello, uh, Dr. So uh, th uh, thank you so much for your uh, great presentation, a wonderful presentation. I just wanted to know one thing that over the last few years, we have observed that the faction of German youth uh, has expressed their anger against uh, the refugees coming from Middle East or, or the African region or the, migra or the migrants coming from Asia. So how do uh, the German anthropologists uh, perceive this hostility of German youth against the, uh, the migrants or the refugees uh, coming from all over the world. Thank you. It's an important uh, comment. And uh, Adebola, yes, please. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, thank you for your lectures. Uh, I'm aware of uh, three types of anthropology. Oh, I can't hear you. Yeah, it's connection, I think. 
Yeah, connection is lost. Hello, Arevola. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Yes, yes, you're back. Can, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, very good. Thank you, Professor. I said I have planned about three types of anthropology. Uh, one, uh, the imperial anthropology, which is regarded as a gemonian of uh, the Anglo American. Uh, the liberal anthropology, I believe, is Eurocentric. But you have taught me now about the uh, word anthropology, which I believe uh, is a sort of radical shift, a sort of hybrid of imperial and uh, liberal. Uh, my question Excellent. is Does it mean that, uh, you know, uh, based on what you have said about the uh, word anthropology, uh, which I see as a critical transformation, uh, that makes us to believe that uh, anthropology should go beyond metropolitan to cosmopolitan, as you have said. Does it mean that uh, what anthropology is, uh, can, we, can it be described as a culture of global peace? Of, sorry, of global, global peace. peace. Global peace, yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much uh, for uh, summarizing also this very important, um, my motivation was also right to decolonize in a way uh, anthropology. So thank you very much for summarizing that. Okay, great. Yeah, so as a Any... comments, yeah. yeah. No, everybody is a bit tired, I think. <laughs> it has been a long day, yes. Yeah, long it's day. Yeah. Long very week. long day. And and yeah, long two weeks. Yeah. So any any more comments and any more questions? Afifa, it's okay. What what is okay? <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy. Okay. <laughs> Any more questions before we, we end the may, session? May I say something? Yes, of course, Dilavar. Uh, thank you so much uh, to everyone, uh, the organizers and uh, Dr. Alexander for a wonderful day. So I was just thinking to share my perspective that uh, I, I may be right or wrong, just wanted to share because it, it seems like relevant to me that uh, the culture of peace, uh, peace culture is very much contextual. Uh, because uh, living in Pakistan, like uh, one of the conflict zone, including uh, the neighbors is like Afghanistan, who, who unfortunately they have been uh, in the conflict from last four decades. And then the Pakistan issues with around uh, the neighbors and the neighbors conflict with Pakistan. Even within uh, the, the Pakistani society facing an identity issue, being a Pashtun, uh, so I believe like uh, the culture of peace, we, 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 we may understand uh, hundreds of tools and instrument uh, for peacemaking and peacekeeping. But I believe like at least uh, under after understanding and learning any tool, uh, this is my own practice. I, I try to apply it in the context that whether it fits in our context or not. Uh, so I believe like this course is a wonderful course. So uh, although it, it, it is a difficult for any of the person who is, uh, who is engaged in professional work, like uh, we, we may not have a very flexible timing of jobs in Pakistan and neither a very uh, polite nature of uh, employers. But it was one of the, well, my, I, I was thinking that I should be part of this course that I should uh, uh, enrich my uh, understanding around this uh, course. So I, I feel like uh, if, if we could get an opportunity, if we uh, let a uh, participant to share one of their own personal exp experiences anytime in the course, if the slot allows, that we can also understand like if some tool is working in Pakistan, whether it is working in uh, Indonesia or not or what are the similar tools that it means we, we will be able to understand uh, or at least to come up with a few of the tools that is uh, uniform and workable in any context. And thank you so much. This was something I wanted to share.
Thank you. Thanks so much you. for expressing your uh, um, feelings and and um, and yeah and and thoughts, ideas. Uh, yeah, if I can, if I can respond very briefly, Dilavar, uh, rather than using the, yes, the, the, you know, rather than thinking of using that word in the singular, that you speak about culture of peace. Uh, I think in anthropology, there is always a tendency that we speak in plural. So there are cultures of peace. Right, and, right, right, right. Yeah. So the. Thank you. So when you have uh, your experiences in in Pakistan. The, the kind of what often happens is that uh, when you look at the UN, uh, there are a number of people that have created this concept of culture of peace. And what is interesting is that uh, it, it entails the imposition of their idea of what peace culture is all about and mm -hmm. not giving that. Uh, I, think, I think this is what Alexander was also right. emphasizing. Right. The not giving uh, the you know the indigenous peoples the traditional peoples so many of these kinds tend to be imposed from above so this mm. is how the culture of peace is like this is what peace culture is like and this is how it's going to be uh, say in Pakistan and this is where we have to break uh, you know we have to emancipate ourselves move away from that kind of imposition so. None of us, I would not ever say that I am an expert in any of these uh, mm -hmm. areas. And what I can say is that I can provide you with some knowledge and, and this knowledge is not complete. It is always something that we uh, are in the process of adding and completing. But yeah, Dilabar, you can play an important role. And the sharing which you described, I think is absolutely fantastic. Uh, it should not just come from uh, Alexander or come from me. It has to be ultimately uh, sharing, say, you and Mas Ari, you know, uh, Indonesia, or you and, uh, you know, say, Anna. Uh, Anna is Indonesian, but she is based in Thailand. So this is how we, we begin to create the, the sharing process. But having said that, the role that we are playing in this course is, I would think, that we are really facilitators. So we are, you know, we, we don't feel, I, I hope I have not brought this across in my presentation. I'm not an expert in whatever field, but I'm providing some of my ideas for you to think about and to reflect mm. on. And that's why the, the, the reflective piece that you're doing is actually your own reflection. So it's encouraging you and, you know, and, and, and also inviting you, you know, to, to reflect on what we, we, the various, all of us have been presenting. And ultimately it's bringing all these, once again, I won't use the word knowledge, but knowledges. And that's why we tend to use the, the plural. Cultures, knowledges, epistemologies, and there is no one way of doing things. But what happened is for a very long time, uh, we have been, you know, especially we, I'm talking about myself, we have been given this kind of, of idea that there is only one way of doing things. And this is the way that comes from the West. But we are challenging that now. We are challenging it in peace studies. We are challenging that Adebola has, mm. has raised it in the context of, you know, Gambia where you find that uh, in, in, you know, you talk about anthropology and I think this is a wonderful characterization of anthropology, but Africa has for a very long time avoided anthropology precisely because the anthropology has played a role in the colonial administration in Africa, in almost every part, whether it's French or British. And that's why when African countries uh, became independent, one of the first things they made sure was not to have any anthropology. So anthropologists in, in Africa are referred to as historians. But, it, um, and you know, we have now some wonderful um, people like, you know, Mahmoud Mamdani, who is my, one of my favorite writers. And there are so many other 
uh, one, you know, wonderful anthropologists who are from Africa. But we, we need to, to kind of bring, bring all these different knowledges. And I don't want to speak anymore because uh, as an anthropologist, we have a tendency to keep on telling stories. Yeah, and the, it's, it's, the point is, uh, as Alberto stressed, that um, every culture is unique. Yeah, and what I stressed again and again is that we have to develop the peace education that we want to apply uh, should be community centered and community sensitive, mm -hmm. and that's the whole point. Um, uh, we don't. It's dangerous to come up with um, to say that we we know all about the peace culture and that uh, we want to impose a peace culture. That's a dangerous thinking. And, uh, and I understand, Alberto, that, that DEEP is, is, is based actually on, 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 the, um, uh, on the premise of a mutual um, respect and, and, and listening and, uh, and, uh, and solidarity. Than, rather than anything else. Okay. You're most welcome, uh, Delivar. All right. Uh, once again, I'm, I'm going to thank uh, Alexander and uh, right. Danke schön, Danke schön. <laughs> merci, merci, uh, thank you. Terima uh, <laughs> kase. <laughs> Kop kun krab. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah, take care, and we will move Jesus to the Timothy. other. We will move to the other room, okay? Uh, and uh, and yes, sorry. Sorry to interrupt, Rob. Uh, how about the the link, the Google form? Should we circulate now, or? Uh, maybe is it is it okay if we circulate it uh, through my class? Okay. So okay. okay. Or, 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 or WhatsApp group. Yeah. The only thing about WhatsApp, uh, Masari, is that not everyone is on WhatsApp. Okay. So okay. We can we can do both. We can put okay. on WhatsApp as well as uh, Luna Visa. Yes. Visa. Post, we, we we post on the announcement. Uh, we will post the the link. Thank you for reminding me. I completely forgot about okay. that. Any other things that I've, I've forgotten? No, they're just, just that thing. Yeah, so that tool. Huh? Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I just said I just said that I, I'm old, so I, I tend to forget a lot of things these days. <laughs> <laughs> You're young. <laughs> yeah. No, but, 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 but I'm also, it's because of my malaria, you know, so it attacked my brains, so I can't. Oops, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, once again, good night, uh, good morning, good afternoon, <laughs> or whatever time you are. And, you know, and, you know, thank you once again, uh, Alex, and, and thank you. Uh, and we, and, and all of you, I should say, you have been absolutely, absolutely fabulous. Can't think of any, um, you know any marvelous group as this one so we are we, <laughs> we are so pleased extremely pleased that all of you have you know decided to take this course and hopefully yeah we'll it's we'll still going it. on right <laughs> it's still going on that's right <laughs> yeah it, it has been a tiring exhausting but uh yeah. most you know exhilarating okay, okay you bye. take care bye. Bye. Okay, bye. See you.